I'd like to welcome everybody here to the discussion of muscle weakness, genetic defect in Holstein calves. Uh, I'd like to have you mute your mics and uh, turn your video off. Uh, as we go through the program, if you will put questions in the chat box uh, at the bottom of the page, we'll get to them at the conclusion. Uh, if we have time uh, at the end of the program, we'll have folks open their mics up for questions. Today's presenter is Dr. Chad D. Chow. He's Associate Professor of Dairy Cattle Genetics at Penn State and grew up on a small dairy in New York State, milking Holsteins and a few brown Swiss. He loved working with the cows and showing cows at the fairs with family and friends, so it was a natural career for him. Uh, eventually, he finished his education and became a dairy cattle geneticist. He will outline the newly identified genetic defect in Holstein calves, officially named Early Onset Muscle Weakness Syndrome, or MW when you read it in the media. That affects Holstein calves' ability to stand. Today, he will discuss the emergence of the genetic defects and discovery of the MW mutation, the clinical signs, and prognosis. As I always say, Dr. D. Chow, the podium is yours. All right. Thank you, Fred. I appreciate that introduction. And as we're going along, if somebody does have a question, some I am not opposed to somebody raising their hand or, or getting my attention somehow and interrupting me and asking for more details and so forth. I, I won't I will not be offended by that if you if you choose to do that. So just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview, what I'm going to talk about today, we're going to spend a little bit of time just looking at some old bulls and some inbreeding trends to talk about where this mutation emerged from and so forth. Then we'll talk a little bit more about calf recumbency itself, and then we'll talk about uh, some genetic testing considerations and so forth. But I want to start, I'm going to start here talking about the father of the modern Holstein breed. So we call this bull here, Osborne Dale Ivanhoe, who was born in 1952. We refer to him as the father of the modern Holstein breed. And he had 137 sons that were enrolled in NAAD programs, at least in the files that I have access to, and over 10,000 daughters that were enrolled in DHI testing programs. So a fairly prolific son. And one of the things that's kind of, so I'm going to share with you the story about uh, finding these defect a little bit. And it's always kind of neat because, you know, Penn State's had a role in some of these genetic defects for better or worse as well. And so Ivanhoe was the sire of Penn State Ivanhoe Star, who was born here on campus in 1963. And he had 152 sons and, and just shy of 20,000 daughters in his proof. By far his most influential progeny was Carlin M. Ivanhoe Bell, who was born 11 years later in the same year I was born, actually, in 1974. And he had 570 sons in AI in the U.S. and 80,000 daughters. And, and, and that was kind of, he was prominent during the time period in the early 80s when we started really exporting a lot of semen. And so a lot of his semen was sent overseas and so forth as well. And then he had a, a bull from a son from Texas, actually, Southwind Bella Barley, who was born in 1984, who was a, also a fairly popular sire, quite a few sons in AI and, and close to 30,000 daughters. So, but what's interesting about uh, Ivanhoe, Penn State Ivanhoe stars, when we start to look at Holstein lineages, what we find is that they're on the male side, at least, if we're just tracing the male pedigree and kind of the Y chromosome ancestry, if you will, there really aren't a lot of Y chromosome lineages that are left. So we've got uh, Pawnee Farmer Linda Chief up here at the top, about half of the bulls in the United States and actually worldwide, if we look at Holstein bulls, about half 
can trace their sire lineage back to Pawnee Farmer Linda Chief. And we've got Penn State Ivanhoe Star. He was somewhat common in the in terms of the male lineage side through the 80s and 90s, but he carried a couple recessive diseases that ended up in his male lineage. A lot of his male descendants having were uh, those lines did not continue because his sons tested positive for some some stillborn calf defects. And then uh, elevation, round oak ragged apple elevation is also about 50% of sires traced through them. So, you know, we've done a lot of great things with genetic selection in the dairy industry. And, but one of the consequences of genetic selection, regardless of how you do it, is, is inbreeding. That's just a, a natural concept, consequence of genetic selection that we can't ever completely get around. And so when you think about this, this is looking at inbreeding trends from the 1960s to currently. And we start at 1960 and uh, call that 0%. So all the numbers are, are based on a comparison to 1960. And you, as you can see, we we're kind of slow and steady inbreeding until the early 1980s. And then we had a pretty, pretty intense sire selection. And we are selecting on the basis of milk fat and protein yield plus type confirmation were really the traits that were driving it at that particular point in time. So we had a pretty high rate of inbreeding at that period of time. And then it slowed just a little bit in both Holsteins and Jerseys for somewhat different reasons. We started to introduce new traits like productive life and daughter pregnancy rate and so forth in the late 90s and early 2000s. So we expanded our selection goal. And when we did that, that introduced new bloodlines and, and opened up the door for new blood, bloodlines to contribute. Jerseys, that was true. But also, in addition to that, they started, in order to try and control their rate of inbreeding, they introduced bulls from Denmark. And slowly, those were incorporated into our uh, U.S. dairy cattle population. And that really kind of halted inbreeding in the Jersey population for a good while. And then with genomic selection, that's kind of released all the holds that were that were on inbreeding prior to that. So so we end up with a situation where we are we should expect to see the emergence of some genetic recessives. Uh, that's, that's always going to be true, but especially in our area, where we're turning our generations over pretty quickly. We were expecting to see some of that. One example, again, I, I like sharing the, the Penn State part of the story here. So this is a Penn State Ivanhoe Star's pedigree. His sire was Osborne Dale Ivanhoe, so the father of the Holstein breed. Ivanhoe was a carrier of bovine leukocyte adhesion deficiency, or BL, which he passed on to Penn State Ivanhoe Star. And Penn State Ivanhoe Star was also a carrier of CVM, so complex vertebral malformation. Uh, he did not inherit that from, from Ivanhoe. So we believe that he inherited that from Penn State Lucifer Anner Star, or it was a mutation that originated in Penn State Ivanhoe Star himself. And so uh, Anna Star Sire was was named Lucifer. This is a picture of Lucifer the bull down here. This is a picture of of uh, Anna Star, and this is a picture of a calf that uh, when you get two copies of that defective recessive condition, you end up with stillborn calves. So, uh, so Penn State's had a history with working with some of these conditions and so forth. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the one that uh, we've been working with the last three years, and that's a calf recumbency in Holstein calves. And, and What's interesting is how this came to my attention. I had written an article in Hordes Dairyman about cholesterol deficiency, which is a condition where calves, if they have two copies of the recessive mutation, the calves are not able to produce cholesterol or absorb cholesterol from their diet, and they perish within a couple months of birth, typically. Uh, there are a couple that have survived longer using essentially cholesterol injections and so forth. Uh, but I had, I had written that article and, and some veterinarians in New York state were working with some herds that had some calves that had some difficulties. And so I'll show you a short video clip here. <laughs> 
on this next slide of the, one of these calves, if I can figure out how to play the video, hopefully. Maybe I won't be able to play it. Hmm. Darn. Well, that's okay. So what you would see, actually, there we go. So that right there is the condition that we're talking about. It's calves that, um, as you can see, this calf it was healthy enough. They gave it an ear tag and so forth. These calves eat well. They appear to be perfectly healthy, except for the fact that they can't stand up. And so this was first noticed on a herd in, in New York State. And the veterinary clinic got a hold of me when that happened. And so I, I told them, well, I, I've not heard of this from anybody else. If you've got any tissue, go ahead and send it to me. I'll put it in the freezer. And if we have some other people that come up with something similar, then we've got that at least banked. And, and maybe someday we'll be able to find the mutation associated with that or determine if it's even genetic. So sometimes you see something that happens in one herd and it turns out to, to be an environmental effect, some weird environmental effect that nobody could have predicted. Uh, but in fact, they had necropsied this calf at Cornell's vet school and the, and the folks that were involved there, Elisha Fry, who was one of the co-authors on that initial paper, uh, that she had been working with another client that had seen kind of the same thing. So they sent me the material from those two calves and that kind of kicked off this research project. So that was in 2020. And so that kicked us off. And so in terms of the, I'm just going to kind of give you a little bit of an idea how the, the research process works a little bit in terms of how we go about uh, discovering these mutations and so forth. And some of you, depending on your interests, some of you will find this interesting and some of you will be like, I just want to know about the condition itself. But uh, so we'll, we'll go through it here a little bit. But uh, so that first farm in New York, there were 10 recumbent calves that they had observed. Of those, eight died or were euthanized. None of them were the result of embryo transfer, and they were all different. So some of them had the same sire, but none of them had the same sire dam combination. So that was the, the herd. So they had 10 of these. So that was the herd that first was working with their veterinarian and in why I was alerted to it, because they had a pretty big problem with it. The second herd in New York had three recumbent calves. All of those died. Uh, interestingly, they were all the result of embryo transfer and came from two sire dam pairs. Uh, then I went out to, we have some other research that was herds that I'm working with, and I've asked them if they had seen anything. And one of those was a herd in Pennsylvania, and the producer, I'll never forget the look on his face when I, I was asking him if he had any calves that couldn't stand up. And he was, he just kind of stared at me for a few seconds. And he's like, who have you been talking to? So it turned out that he had a couple calves that were uh, fairly valuable calves from a pedigree standpoint at that particular point in time that could not stand up. And unfortunately, three of those were euthanized and they were all the result of embryo transfer and a a couple of sire dam combinations there. And then there was a herd in Florida that had three sire dam combinations. It was all the same sire and then three different dams. He had done a lot of IVF work with that particular sire. Uh, he'd also used that sire as an, as an AI sire. And he had some calves that, that were recumbent and could not stand up from that sire. And even a natural service mating that had resulted in that. So so that was, at that point, we had enough animals that had the condition that we could start to think about doing some genomic analysis to see if we if we thought that that would be a genetic condition. So, uh, so what you will notice here is that in all these herds, we have a, a total of 34 calves that had this recumbency phenotype at some point in time. And so that video of that calf that I just showed you is pretty typical. 
usually calves, you know, they it's variable, but usually within the first week or so of life, they're just not able to stand up. And in most cases, they never recover from that condition. There are some calves that are, are born unable to stand up and that do eventually recover and are able to stand up. Uh, there are some calves that are okay for a week and then they go down and then the farmer really works with them and massages them and helps them stand and, and they seem to recover to some extent. But even then, in some cases, uh, working with a, a different herd from New York, they had a calf that they had kind of nursed along. And uh, after three, three months or so that it, calf was able to stand and they thought they were in good shape. And then when the when that was a heifer at that particular point in time was about a year old, she went down again. At that point, she was too big for them to work with to get her to stand up and she never recovered and was euthanized. So there's some variability in the presentation of the condition. And so that gave us a little bit of pause when we first started. But so of that initial population of 34, about two thirds of them ended up dying or were euthanized. In a lot of cases, those calves were euthanized, not because they couldn't stand up, but because they developed secondary conditions like pneumonia and so forth from just being down all the time. In particular, the herd in Florida, they were exploring whether this was something related to their IVF procedures, because with IVF, you know, IVF works really well, but but sometimes you can get big calf syndrome and, and some other things. And, and that had been initially where they were kind of looking to see if maybe there was just a, a batch of IVF that had gone wrong and, and were affecting them. So a lot of them were embryo transfer calves, but not all of them. All right. And so they did, you know, these calves were, one was sent to UC Davis to have its brain uh, necropsy. Uh, they did lots of different things with these calves to see if they could find anything. And there really just wasn't anything. Lots of blood tests. They didn't find too much at all. So we took this data. We didn't have uh, DNA from all of these calves. We had DNA from about 20 of these calves, in particular, the New York farms. Uh, by the time they had gotten in touch with me, a lot of those calves had, had long been dead and I didn't have material from them. But so then the next step is then to do a genomic analysis. And we call it a genome-wide association study and determine if it looks like there could be a genetic component to this. And so this is, we call this a Manhattan plot, and it, it's called a Manhattan plot because it's, it's supposed to look somewhat like the skyline of Manhattan, where you have you know, a lot of kind of smaller skyscrapers and then a few huge ones. And when you see this here, that's an indicator that, uh, so this is, these, genome-wide association studies, this was based on, there's 140,000 dots on this particular chart. So we did genotype these calves for 140,000 DNA markers. And then we're looking to see, are any of those markers strongly associated or a group of them associated with this condition? And the answer to that was yes. And it was significant. And there was a, a region on chromosome 16. So it's on the kind of toward the end of chromosome 16. And so, so that looked really promising, but there was one thing that just uh, was kind of not, that gave us some pause and, and made us worry that maybe we're not quite on the, on the right trail. And so this is looking at the affected calves. So we had 18 calves that were affected. Every single one of those calves had that particular region on chromosome 16. So RH in this particular case stands for the recumbent haplotype. And we we named these named it a few different things. Initially, I called it uh, motor inability, but the veterinarians didn't like that term. They preferred to call it recumbency. And then the Holstein Association, once their members were involved and they learned more about it, called it uh, early onset muscle weakness. So the, the name isn't necessarily important, but when I say recumbency and RH, that's what I'm referring to. So every single one of the affected calves had that particular haplotype and they had two copies of that haplotype. So that was good. Uh, there were a lot of 
the other animals that we tested that were had one copy of that particular haplotype. And we had tested a lot of as many siblings as we could and the sires and the dams to the extent that we could. So that was expected that there would be a, a lot of carriers in this particular population. And this is actually one of the things that I sometimes when I work with people on genetic conditions that I have a tough time getting across to them is I don't need just DNA from a calf with a problem. I need DNA from a calf with a problem and as many relatives, especially close relatives as we can get in order to really find the condition. But the one problem was this calf here. So we had this one calf that uh, this was actually a calf from Florida. Um, they went back through their records. That calf had never had any troubles at all. I don't know what happened to that calf because they actually sold a lot of heifers. And that was one of the heifers that they had sold before we had really narrowed down this genetic region. So, so that raised, raised some questions about, are we really on the right track or have we discovered something that's not completely penetrant? So when we tend to think of genetic conditions, and so for example, I showed you that picture of that calf that had CVM, that stillborn calf that the mutation traced back to Penn State Ivanhoe star. Every single time a calf gets two copies of that mutation, the calf is born dead. Every single calf that gets two copies of cholesterol deficiency is unable to absorb or produce cholesterol and they end up perishing. So clearly we had something different here. In addition to that, some of these that were affected did recover as well. So that that raised the, the question of, are we dealing with something that has incomplete penetrance? And so now we believe that that is, is the case. And we'll look at some of the statistics later about uh, in terms of testing, how many have shown up. Um, there is another fairly recent example of partial penetrance. This is a condition that was found by French researchers. And essentially this particular condition, uh, the animals, they're supposed to retain some immune cells in their intestines in order to fight intestinal disease and they do not. And so they tend to grow more slowly because they're dealing with more intestinal disease and so forth. And this really, at this point, it hasn't quite been fully, there's not a, a great genetic test for this at this point in time. It's still in the research phase is the kind of the, the long and the short of it. But what they find is that calves that have this, they, they have a growth, they, a growth delay and they have a higher mortality rate, but it's not 100%. So we are now kind of getting to the point in our genomic evaluation system where we're able to, de to detect these diseases where it's not just completely homozygous recessive means that the animal perishes. It's, it's actually uh, partially penetrant where some animals will have it and appear relatively normal and others do not. So, but that still left us with the question, we, we've got this condition that looks like there is a genomic region that looks promising, uh, maybe partially penetrant, but do the pedigrees indicate, is there a shared pedigree that we can look at that would indicate that this is something that continue following? And so this is just a pedigree of a couple of the different, this was the most common pedigree here on the left-hand side. And so there were nine, this solid circle means that there were nine calves that were affected by this particular condition. And we were able to trace back both sides of the pedigree to a bull born in 2010 named Super Sire. And we'll talk a little bit more about him on the next slide. And his sire was robust. And then this was an example. So this is the most common pedigree that we had for these affected calves. And this was the most, the most inbred pedigree of these particular affected calves. And so we had three calves that were affected here. And as you can see, they all trace back to robust, but they don't all necessarily trace back to robust son super sire. And so, uh, as you can see, a fair amount of some brother sister matings and everything in this particular pedigree. So a fair amount of inbreeding uh, and they all trace back to robust.
So Robust and Super Sire. So Robust was born in 2008, kind of at the right at the beginning of genomic testing. And uh, he was a fairly popular bull, but really his son, Seagull Bay Super Sire, was the bull that was that was really popular. And Robust and Super Sire do trace back. So this is uh, Ivanhoe again. So they both trace back to Ivanhoe. And this chart down here is just showing you the year the bull was born. So Super Sire was born in 2010. His inbreeding is 7.2% based on his pedigree. But the number that's interesting here is his future inbreeding. So this is a, an indicator of how related a bull is to the rest of the Holstein population. And so what it means is if we just randomly go out and mate a cow to Super Sire, we expect his offspring to be 12.5% inbred. And just to kind of give you an, an idea of how close mating that is, that would be a, a, a sibling mating, a half sibling mating. So if we double this number, 25% is essentially how many genes he shares in common with the rest of the Holstein population. So he's about 25% related to the rest of the Holstein population. He is the most related bull to the Holstein breed. So unfortunately, this condition occurred, or at least appeared to occur in a family that was the most related to the Holstein breed. However, there was one random calf that came to my attention toward most of the way. I think we'd actually already published the initial paper when this calf came to my attention. I called it a random calf. It was actually a calf owned by a family of, of my postdoctoral student at the time, Lydia Hardy, who's actually has her PhD from Iowa State. So there's an Iowa State connection here. And her family had one of these calves. The calf's name was was Jinx, and Jinx did not sh did not have Super Sire in his pedigree or her pedigree, excuse me, and uh, really didn't have any logical connection or obvious connection to that the pedigree that we'd been working with. So that kind of raised some questions. Uh, that particular calf, Lydia, the project she was working on, we were working with organic dairy cows and her family's farm is an organic dairy herd. And we'd been genotyping some animals and, and her family's herd was one of the herds that we had genotyped. So we did have some DNA available. Uh, well, I shouldn't say we had DNA available. We had sent Jinx's DNA in for genotyping and the genotype came back as well. She carries at least a copy of that particular mutation. And so we started looking at, okay, where in Jinx's pedigree is there a common ancestor? And we went back to the bull Southwind, who was born in 1984. And then the question is, was he related to Robust? And, and yes, he is. So Southwind's uh, Robust, you can see here. So his, his daughter Saturday and then her uh, great-grandson Robust. So... At that point, we're now thinking, okay, this mutation, which we had not discovered at this particular point in time, probably goes back to the bull Southwind. And then just one more piece of the puzzle here. Southwind, when we finally got some DNA and, and were able to genotype him, he was homozygous for this particular region. And he inherited that from Ivanhoe. But... So this goes from Ivanhoe to Penn State Ivanhoe star to Bell, and then Bell passed this haplotype on the south wind. But Penn State Ivanhoe star did not carry the genetic defect. So, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about haplotypes later. So we somewhere along the line, the mutation occurred between Ivanhoe and south wind. And so he had Ivanhoe on both sides of his pedigree. We actually think that it had occurred Either Southwind himself was the first one to have his mutation or his dam or his grand dam. Uh, this individual here is Elevation, who we know did not carry the mutation. So somewhere in these three animals, this mutation occurred. 
But by knowing that that was south wind and that he appeared to be homozygous for this particular region, that helped us out when it came to the next step of the process, which was to actually go ahead and try to sequence, to do whole genome sequencing. So our genomic testing currently, so the, the genome of most mammals, including cattle, has pretty close to 3 billion DNA base pairs. We cannot test that many DNA base pairs for a large number of animals. For one thing, it's just too expensive. It costs several hundred dollars to do a whole genome sequence on an animal. But maybe even more important than that is that just the computer processing power to process all that data is just too much. So we test instead in our genomic evaluations, we use 80,000 DNA markers. And because they're all from the same chromosomes, that that tells us most of the information that we need, but there's always reason that we need to go back and sequence to find the exact mutation. So that's what we did. We uh, sequenced the, the one of the calves that had died, uh, that calf's sire, and then we sequenced Southwind as well. In addition to that, the Cooperative Dairy DNA Repository works with the USDA Agile Lab in Beltsville, Maryland, and they have a few hundred bulls that have been genome sequenced. So we were able to look and see if there were markers in there. That looked uh, promising after we discovered these, then we looked here to see is this in other family lines and so forth. And then we particularly targeted one region that we had discovered earlier. One of the challenges is that it was about uh, 2 million base pairs long. So it was on the 78, there's 80 million base pairs on chromosome 16, and this was somewhere in the 2 million base pairs on the end of the chromosome. There are 100 genes in that region, and there's a whole bunch of them that are involved in, in uh, defects that are associated with muscle and uh, neuropathies and so forth. So, so anyway, we went ahead and did that sequencing. That uh, got us from 2 million base pairs to 18. From those 18, 14 of those, there's different types of mutations. 14 of those looked like that we call them insertion deletions. And those can be kind of tricky to uh, sequence. And it, it looked like those were maybe some false positives, if you will. And so then there were four single nucleotide polymorphisms. And so we then looked at those single nucleotide nucleotide polymorphisms. Along with these indels, we still did track them. And of those, then we looked to see, okay, is it predicted to have a bad effect? And one of those 18 was predicted to have a, an effect on a protein coding gene that we'll talk about here in a second. And it indicated that the mutation was deleterious. So we went from a 2 million base pairs to 18 to, to 1 through that particular process. And that mutation is in a gene called calcium channel voltage dependent L-type alpha 1S subunits or CACNA1S. And so it was a G to A mutation. So that caused an amino acid change from glycine to serine. And that particular mutation uh, was also in animals that had that haplotype in the larger database had that mutation as well. So, so then we were beginning to become more confident that we had found the right mutation. The affected calf, this chart's just showing all red here, the affected calf had two copies. The sire had one copy because we've got blue and red and south wind way back in his pedigree had one copy because we have blue and red. So that was a pretty good indicator that we were along the right track. And then the next step in this process is to look at different species and look, does this uh, mutation, is it common in other species and so forth? And so this is just the amino acid sequence from, from normal cattle, human, goat, horse, dog, mouse. We can also look in zebrafish and we actually find that it's even pretty similar in, in zebrafish. And that affected calf is the same except for that one spot right there. So that was just further evidence that we are along the right trail and then what kind of got us to the point where we were comfortable, because one of the things that I was really worried about, particularly uh, because a lot of these animals, these are uh, 
these are people's breeding stock that they've invested money in, and you do not want to be wrong and and uh, call an animal uh, genetically defective when it is not, because you can you can cost somebody with a valuable animal lots of money, and I did not want to do that, so we were fairly cautious, particularly given that it appeared to be incompletely penetrant. That then led us to looking at, okay, where is this gene expressed? And so one of the things that uh, is done is that uh, we, we chew up rats and mice and determine whether genes are active in particular tissues or not. And in the rat, they have tested muscle tissue and this gene is really highly expressed in muscle tissue. And you can see it really isn't expressed in the brain and heart, the kidney, the lung, so on and so forth. So this was, at this point, we're pretty confident we are on the right track. Uh, when we looked at the mouse, we did see the, the each species, how they, the muscles that are, or excuse me, the tissues that are tested are a little bit different, but there was some expression in the limbs of the of the mice during embryonic development and then also in the mammary gland and, and I've not had any tissue from a mammary gland of an animal that uh, carries this yet to see is this expressed in in mammary gland in cattle and does this mutation affect uh, calcium channel and so forth in the mammary gland that'll maybe be in the future something that we're interested in but that was kind of interesting but anyway the muscle expression uh, made this a again a pretty good candidate gene, and so this mutation I I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but basically a calcium channel helps the muscle to contract. Uh, these calcium channels they have these six segments. In the fourth segment here is what actually carries the voltage itself, and then there's this pore, and then this this six segment domain is repeated four times. And then you have this, this area here where calcium comes in and out. And the mutation was in the fifth segment of the fourth domain. So um, that's what we had. There are, interestingly, some similar conditions in other species. So this was actually one of the very first mutations in livestock that was really described that, that showed a genetic condition and a mutation and how it affects animals. And we could have a genetic test for it. And this was in the early 1990s. And so there was a, a quarter horse stallion named Impressive, who was a very famous show horse, partly because he had very well-developed muscles. The reason he had well-developed muscles is because he had a mutation that caused those muscles to be subclinically twitching all the time. So mutation bestows beauty and death on quarter horses was the New York Times headline for this particular mutation. And this occurs in a sodium channel in muscle, which leads to a condition called hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. Uh, that, that calcium channel also has linkage to porcine stress syndrome. So porcine stress syndrome is due to a mutation in the R Y R one gene, which is in the membrane on the muscle cells, and it interacts directly. You can see this loop here of the CACNA1S gene is interacting with this particular condition. And so these particular pigs, they have uh, fainting episodes and, and so forth. A lot of them perish and die, but, but not all of them. So I had some similar phenotype to that as well. And these pictures are from Ken Stalder, uh, who was at Iowa State as well. And then, of course, human and mice, we always look to see, has this been described in human and mice? And mutations in this particular gene have been pretty well described. This particular gene causes a lot of, and there's more than one mutation in humans. There can be many in different parts of the gene. And there's actually a periodic paralysis association in most of the conditions that they're working with and the people that are affected by this, it's due to a mutation in this particular gene. They get, uh, instead of hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, they have hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So episodes of paralysis and different uh, other types as well. Malignant hyperthermia, which was something that uh, pigs that had the porcine stress syndrome, they would have that as well and so forth. 
What's interesting is that this particular mutation is actually dominant rather than recessive in a lot of instances. And you can have two family members with the exact same genotype that uh, act very differently in terms of how the disease condition presents. So this was uh, just further confirmation that the mutation that we had found, uh, you can never be 100% sure, but you can be 99% sure. So we're 99% we're sure that this is, this is correct. And so mouse knockouts, they, they disrupted this gene in mice and it has a similar result and is often lethal. So based on that, we felt good about going ahead and developing a genetic test for it. That test is, is currently offered by, th by three companies, but it, a number of companies will, will continue to increase that are, that are offering it. Uh, so Phoenix is a, a kind of a startup company that's now in North Carolina, Genetic Visions ST, and then Igenity through Neogen also offers this particular test at this particular point in time. All right, so I, I want to look a little bit at some of the results now that more animals have been tested from this. So these are sire testing results that the Holstein Association keeps a running tab of all the AI bulls that have been tested. And so a little over 7,000 have been tested so far. 92% of those have tested free. So they use the term TE, so tested, and then E is means free of the early onset muscle weakness. About 8.3% of animals are carriers of this condition. And then 0.03% have two copies of this. So again, confirming that this is not 100% penetrant. And there have been two bulls that have been tested that have two copies of this. Now, one of those bulls, uh, the company that owns that bull, when the result came back, was not surprised because it was a bull that was it was fairly valuable from a genomic PTA standpoint, but it was pretty unhealthy as a calf and they had to work with it a lot. And uh, so they weren't surprised by that at all. The other one was a little bit more of a surprise. So when you look at this here, the expected frequency of individuals that would have two copies is, is 13 bulls and instead we have two. So that's just further confirmation that yeah, we're on the right track in terms of the mutation itself, and but it's not completely penetrant. And so we're expecting 0.174% uh, of the Holstein population would have two copies of this in theory. And if it's less than that, that that's, then that's an indicator that a lot of these calves have probably perished before they've been genetically tested. Now, a lot of people that do genomic testing are familiar with haplotype tests as well. And so this is a test that's not a direct test for the gene, but it's testing for markers that flank that gene. And so, for example, when I showed you that Manhattan plot with the really tall skyscraper, that was essentially a haplotype test. We were looking at at uh, flanking markers in that particular case. And so this is a way to test for the condition without actually testing for the mutation directly. And there are a few different reasons that uh, people might do that. Uh, th the first is that before you actually find the mutation, sometimes you wanna still do selection in, while you're still searching. So a lot of times we start here and then, but then the other thing is that most of these tests, once they're found, and I'll talk about this a little bit as well, um, there's licensing fees involved. And so this is a, a way to get around those licensing fees to some extent. So they do uh, haplotype code is zero non-carrier free of muscle weakness. One means it's a carrier based on the genetic region and confirmed with the pedigree. Two homozygous for the condition confirmed with the pedigree. Three means we think it's a carrier based on the haplotype. But uh, based on the pedigree, we're not, we can't eliminate that it, that it might be a false positive. In four, it's kind of the same thing. We might have two false positives here. And, and I'll use a chart here to show you what haplotype testing is and why it has some limitations. So this is just looking at an animal that's inherited this stretch of DNA in pink from its dam and this stretch of DNA in blue inherited from the sire. And based on our genomic test of doing 80,000 markers spread across the genome, we're testing for four mutations. Uh, 
T to G, C to T, G to T, A to T. So those are the markers that we're genotyping. And all the, the rest of these, we just assume are, are in linkage and associated with these, but we don't test them directly. So the maternal haplotype in this case, with the calf inherited from its dam is T, C, G, A. And then from the sire, we have G, T, T, C. However, in this particular case, there happens to be a mutation embedded in this haplotype that we don't know about and we're not testing for. And so what we're doing is that we are assuming that if an animal inherits GTTC, it probably has the mutation. And so let's see if my table will come up here. So if an animal, we, we genomically test them based on their haplotype, they come back TCGA. Okay, that, that means they inherited this segment of DNA uh, from their grandmother, essentially. So that animal is a non-carrier and the haplotype says non-carrier. So that's great. Down here, we get GTTC. Okay. Yep. We've got the mutation involved in that. That animal is a carrier. And in fact, the haplotype will call them a carrier. But what happens if we have recombination? So in this particular case, we inherit GT from the sire. And then during meiosis, that sperm has a recombination event. So we have GTGA. Well, now we don't know what we've got. And let's just assume for a second that the, the recombination event occurs here and that the animal really is a carrier. But when we perform that haplotype test, it's going to come back as we're expecting animals that have this mutation to be GTTC. This animal's not. So we might call it a non-carrier or depending on, on how what it's called, we might say that it's that it's an unknown. So all of that is simply to tell you this. Haplotype tests are a great tool for commercial producers to, to kind of monitor in their herd. Do they have this mutation likely present? Is it something they need to be concerned about when they're selecting their service sires and so forth? If you are marketing genetics, and in particularly, if you are buying valuable genetics, you don't want to base it on a haplotype test. You need to know, go and test for the exact mutation itself. All right, so I'm about used up my time. I have a couple slides here that I want that I want to go through, and and uh, so I did. I did have a few people mad at me <laughs> because when we found the condition, we patented it, and we patented a test for it would be the more accurate thing to say. And some, and so there's a. Let's just say that there's debate in the academic community and in the dairy industry about whether we should do so or not. So I like. I've come to appreciate this particular cartoon. So we've got uh, the lawyers are going this way and the engineers that are the inventors are going this way. Nobody likes lawyers. Okay, so it's great to have them go there. But then you have the patent lawyer. So what do you do with this one? He's protecting the inventions of these guys. So why did we at Penn State patent? Well, the bottom line is this, that uh, patenting helps to fund research and development activities. And in fact, there are some, some data that's indicating that uh, limits that have been placed on patents in the biotechnology field has slowed research and development. So, so we, we're, we're happy to patent. Um, in addition to that, probably the biggest frustration for me is that, you know, I, I have research funds from certain projects, but they're all very restricted in terms of how I can spend them and where I can spend it. And so I kind of had to rob Peter to pay Paul a little bit to do the, the testing for this already. I could have applied for a research grant, but it's slow and unpredictable. It'll take me at least a year before the, the grant's reviewed and I have money to be able to do it. And I have a, based on, you know, a 20% chance of it being funded. And I didn't want to wait that long because we were dealing with something where, you know, 0.174% doesn't seem like a lot, but you multiply that by 3 million Holstein heifer calves a year, and we're talking about 5,200 calves. So the, the fact that we were able to, to work with the potential for patenting allowed Penn, Penn State to move the process up a little bit more quickly for me, and that allowed me to uh, find this a little bit more quickly than we would have otherwise. So for example, Jersey the splayed forelimbs, that condition took about 12 years to go from first being reported to finding a mutation. In our case, it took more like three. So, so that helped us to speed the process along a little bit. 
All right. So with that, I'll just summarize. We found a mutation in the CACNA1S gene that causes early onset muscle weakness. Uh, it, it looks like about 50% of homozygous genotype calves do not survive, uh, but there are a lot of calves that don't uh, live long enough to even be genotyped. So it's it's partially penetrant, but uh, most calves that get this uh, don't make it. Commercial tests are available. Uh, if you're using a haplotype test for herd management, that's great. If you're buying and in, in doing any sort of genetic marketing, you need to use the direct test. And hopefully you've gotten a sense through this about how genomic tools have helped us to facilitate the rapid identification. As long as we have DNA available from the affected animals and their relatives. So that's what I've got to share with you today. I do want to point out that, you know, all these types of projects are a group effort. So veterinarians in, in New York and at Penn at uh, University of Florida and Cornell helped a lot with this. Certainly dairy farms provided their data for it. And that was important. The USDA helped to help to with some of this in terms of tracing back and finding the frequency in the population. And then ABS Global actually, they helped me by uh, paying to sequence those animals. So that was one of the ways I was able to, to get this, actually find the mutation was with the help of ABS Global. So with that, I am happy, I'm, I'll stop there and uh, happy to have any discussion or, or questions that you may have. Uh, Fred, I think I'll stop sharing my screen if that's okay. Uh, That'd be perfect. Yep. All right. And first of all, we want to stop by saying thank you very much. Uh, very interesting program. Now, uh, I don't see any uh, questions in the chat, but as I look who's all here, uh, I suspect there's some folks who'd like to unmute and ask questions directly. One follow-up question then on the, the presentation, and I, I may have missed this. What was the estimated penetrance of the, the mutation then? You had the expected number of affected sires that you thought would be there at the end, and I, I didn't do the quick math. Yeah, so so based on that, it would be, say, 85% uh, penetrant. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I think it's quite that high. I'm, and it depends on do you count an animal that's recovered is in the same way or not. So uh, I would say 75%-ish will have at least some level of symptoms. And they're actually, I did mention in humans that there is a, it's partial, it's actually do a dominant mutation in some cases. Uh, some folks have shared with me that they think that this could have animals that carry it probably are fine but they might be a little shaky at times when they're young. So that's really speculative, but I, I do. Th so I think it's a uh, 75% is my guess. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Nicole asks us, how do you feel that dairy farmers should change their breeding programs to plan for this genetic defect moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and so Part of it is that you just use bulls that aren't carriers. And, and it's really, especially if you're a commercial producer, there's enough bulls to pick from that uh, if you aren't planning on marketing any genetics, just don't use a single bull that carries it and you won't have to ever worry about it. Um, unless, you know, there might be some subtle effects if it is in fact partially dominant. But that's that would be my recommendation is just use sires that don't carry it. If you're heavily involved in marketing genetics, now, all of a sudden, you've got a situation where you might have the best bull in the world for your particular mating happens to be a carrier. You want to make sure that the cow you're mating it to is not. And there are now some companies that are actually testing embryos. So that's another option for the kind of the elite IVF types of herds to avoid propagating it. Okay. You had mentioned that uh, Holstein was using some initials. I'm assuming that's on the, the pedigrees. So yeah. I guess what I'd like to know, what else is the breed association doing? And then what are the bull studs do, especially with the bulls that have two copies? Are they printing them in a different color or what? What's, how are they identifying that? 
Yeah, so the the bull studs and the Holstein Association have been pretty good. Now, I, I will tell you, they they drag their feet a little bit. Um, they just because of the partial penetrance, they were cautious about it, much like I was. And and they are the breeders have value of their animals at stake, so I understand why they they drag their feet a little bit. But once they they were confident that in fact this was the mutation, and they were starting to see it in some of their family lines that tested positive, that changed their outlook quite a bit. And so the Holstein Association on their website, every bull that's AI tested, they they request that that information be sent to them and they post that on their website. And part of the reason that they're doing that is that it will help them to refine the haplotype test and make that a little bit more accurate to, to help folks from, from the haplotype test standpoint. Because right now it, it really is, it's, it's kind of a, a better than nothing, but not is accurate as some other haplotype tests for various various reasons in this particular case. But um, so the Holstein Association has just made a commitment to publish all the animals that are carriers. Uh, the bull studs are doing the same thing. I don't know of any that are hiding it. And in fact, most of them, unless it's a really good animal for other traits, they're just not going to breed the, bring them into their breeding program at this point. So that's how we typically deal with these mutations. It gets kind of handled on that end. In the, in the commercial producer, you may, for the next year or so, there might still be some bull floating around the carry it. So you have to pay a little bit of attention on that end and, and communicate with your AI company representative that you, that, you know, don't let me use this bull unless you're telling me, then don't let me use a carrier bull unless you're explicitly telling me you're not. And, and they'll do that. Okay. Hey. A question uh, just popped in. How easy or difficult is it to get this carrier information if you are a producer? So for the bulls themselves, uh, you can go to the Holstein Association website. They have links to it. You can type in the bulls NAB code. It'll show up. It shows up on the on the bulls pedigrees now. Now, I know not a lot of commercial producers, they might want to just know from what the bull stud's providing them. Their bull stud, most the bull proofs now have that on the pedigree. If you see a TE on the pedigree of the bull, you know that they're tested free from it. So, um, and then you can always, if you have a question on an animal and aren't sure, you can you can ask me. I'm happy to, to look up the animal and, and tell you whether it's one at risk or not. Early in your presentation, you mentioned that jerseys had started using imported semen and slowed down their inbreeding increases. So this is really a two-part question. Are foreign bulls being tested? And then what's the effect in my part of the world? We do have a lot of crossbred dairy uh, cows. How does crossbreeding affect the search for this or, or the potential for this? Yeah, so two good questions. The first part in terms of uh, our other countries testing for this, uh, keep in mind that it, at this point, almost all our genetics companies are international genetics companies. And so their bulls are being tested internationally as well. And there are uh, other organizations in Europe that are talking about Nobody in Europe is directly testing it themselves. They'd be working through a U.S. company at this point, but that is probably going to change here in the new future. So foreign bulls are being are being tested, and Super Sire certainly was a bull that was was used worldwide. So that mutation is in other countries as well. Maybe not quite as high as it was here. Uh, so, so the second question is what what effect of crossbreeding? There there are two answers to that question, depending a little bit on what we mean by crossbreeding. In terms of crossbreeding in general, if you've got a Holstein condition and your Holstein cow carries it and you're mating her to a Jersey sire, you've solved the problem of genetic recessives, unless it's a genetic recessive that occurs across breeds. So crossbreeding, that's one of the reasons that crossbreeding works well is because it helps to avoid any unfavorable genetic recessives. And, you know, there are a lot of genetic recessives that, you know, this, in this case, it's a severe condition that results in a calf that can't stand up. There are a lot of other genetic recessives that they're so subtle. You don't even really know that the animal is being affected by it. 
crossbreeding helps to that inbreeding depression overcome that. The second part of that, however, is that for some people, crossbreeding means uh, I'm going to mate my Holstein Jersey cow to a Holstein Jersey bull. Super sire is present in the pedigree of uh, a fair number of crossbred bulls that are available. I don't know that those bulls have been tested. Uh, that's actually something that we've been considering because the Jersey Association also has done some upgrading and allowed. So, for example, my kids show Jersey cows at the local county fair. Um, my father was a Holstein breeder who had a crossbred Jersey cow that my oldest son decided he liked. And now they're showing a bunch of jerseys. And uh, so over time, they allow them to be upgraded. So it is possible that uh, through that type of crossbreeding for a mutation to move from one breed to another. I don't think that that's the case. So I don't want you to go uh, start to ask everybody, well, you think jerseys, I, I don't think it's in the Jersey population, but it, it could be because there are some, some connections across breeds because of crossbreeding. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, so again, uh, Dr. D. Chow, thank you very much for presenting this information. And uh, to everybody uh, on the program as uh, audience, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. And this is the end of the program. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time.